<laughs> hello. Uh, we hello. I'm glad to have you on, Dana, because uh, it's a big week. We've got Windows 11, we've got service devices, and Dana has been doing, like, you're the longest running person at Engadget, Dana, of, for doing PCs and hardware reviews and Windows reviews, too. So glad we could get you on to talk about all that. Um, we're just going to get right into it, chat room. So we're going to kick off the podcast. We're going to do our full recording. Um, so we can't chat with you between, you know, while we're doing that, but Ben will keep an eye on your questions, our producer, and, um, we will have some Q and A at some point, probably towards the end of our recording, uh, just because we're crushed for time. Uh, we're going to start with windows stuff, surface devices around 11 Eastern. Carissa Bell is going to join us to talk about all the Facebook news and that's all kind of a big deal too. So we're going to, you know, we're actually, you know, 1130, Chris is going to join us, but at 11, we're going to try to move on to other news. So we're going to, yeah, we'll How try to cram in as much as we can. We're going to move. Yeah. Big apologies for not being able to take the questions as usual. We really do want to talk about Windows 11 and the new Surface Slate with you, but this is what happens when we have this much technical difficulties. Yeah. We need to stay Ticking in time of, bomb over here. Yeah, we need to stay in sort of inside of a certain time window. <laughs> it's for okay. For video's sake. It's also. actually uh, uh, this is a mindset you want to be in when you're talking about Windows, right? So this is actually, <laughs> oh my God, everything is falling apart. Um, yeah, yeah, this is good. Okay. We're going to kick right off into the show. Is everybody good? Everybody have some water? Yep, yep. Rachel? Okay. And my recording looks good. Just bear with us, chat room. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. <clears throat> Let's start in three, two, one. What's up, Internet? And welcome back to the Engadget Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Devendra Hardawar. I'm Reviews Editor Sherlyn Lowe. And this week, we are joined by our Editor-in-Chief, Dana Woolman. Hey, Dana. Hello, how's it going? It's going well. And we you're joining for a rare occasion, a whole new <laughs> version of Windows. And we're going to be diving into Windows 11, all the Surface devices. Dana reviewed one, I reviewed one. Um, and we'll be talking about a bunch of other stuff too. Some Android news, some Google uh, green news from Sherlyn. And Chris Abel is going to join us to talk about the Facebook, uh, basically all the stuff that the whistleblower has uh, kind of revealed lately. As always, if you're enjoying the Engadget podcast, please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes. That's really super helpful. And you can drop us an email at podcast at Engadget.com. So Dana, I really, really want to chat with you about this because uh, Windows 11 is here. You know, we have both spent some time with it. Uh, Sherlyn, you have too at your preview event. So yeah. what, what are your overall thoughts about Windows 11, Dana? Because it is a rare occasion to have a whole new version of Windows. All right. Well, I'm going to whistleblow myself and say sure. that, um, uh, <laughs> that I was one of the people who said that Windows 11 was ugly. Um, I was so uh mad. -huh. In your <laughs> Windows 11 review. I take it back. Um, it's, it's uncluttered. It's clean. Um, I think what I was really responding to, I think what you were hearing was grouchiness about the center aligned um, yeah. start start menu. Which you I hear that from everybody, it, not just you, Dana. It's everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So I was a bit of a happier camper once I went into the taskbar settings and just pushed it back to the left where I feel like it belongs. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I had a pleasant experience and I would go sort of rewind right back to the um, even the setup process. Um, it was smooth. It was efficient. The splash screens were pretty. Um, setting up Windows Hello took so little time that it actually alarmed me a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah, it like, was really fast. Be, yeah, yeah. How could it be so accurate if it was if it looked at my face for you know like a millisecond? Um, you know, it's a little annoying that you need a Microsoft account. I happen to have one already. I already had two factor authentication set up with um, the Microsoft Authenticator app. So I think for me specifically, it really was painless. But you know handing the machine to Brian O, our video producer to shoot, it was like, oh, you don't have a Microsoft account. Oh, yeah. like, are we going to make one for you? Or am it's I going to uh, give you the pin to yeah. my account and just <laughs> sign out of anything sensitive? You know? That's usually that's usually what I do. But let, let's be clear here, too. So there there is a new restriction, right? Despite Windows 11 looking so much cleaner and nicer and being friendlier, uh, one thing Microsoft told us is that Windows 11 Home, the one a lot of people, the cheaper one that a lot of people are going to be getting 
uh, you know, with the new PC or when they, uh, I think you could still buy it individually, but it requires both an internet connection and a Microsoft account to set up your device. You cannot set up your device without those things. And before uh, Windows 10 was smart enough to be like, if you're online, it would ask for a Microsoft account. If you don't have one, it would kind of default to local account. You can't do that anymore on Windows 11 Home. I think that's going to be super annoying for a lot of people. Microsoft did tell me you can set up a local account afterward. So like after you set up Dana, and if you went into user accounts and was like, hey, let's make an Engadget account for our video guy to just jump into, you could do that. But again, kind of annoying. Windows 11 Pro, the version like IT people and other folks will have, doesn't have that restriction at all because they have to like deploy labs and stuff. So um, I guess you were already like immediately feeling the frustration of some of the restrictions uh, Microsoft put on Dana, right? I think in, in that specific use case, but otherwise mm -hmm. I don't want to take away from the experience of using Windows. Um, for me, it felt, um, it just felt like an uncluttered experience. It felt familiar enough. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like I was dropped into an entirely new world. I read your review and I know you and maybe some other users are missing the, um, the rollover text on the icons. Not even um, rollover, just like having, so the thing we don't have at all in Windows 11 is the ability to see like window labels, you know, the actual like name of your window in the taskbar. Can't do that anymore. They killed it. Um, and that that has kind of messed up my workflow. And I think for a lot of other people too, I know folks from The Verge and Gizmodo and other sites are complaining about the same things. I really enjoyed, um, speaking of workflow, I enjoyed the, um, the ability to hover over the maximize icon mm -hmm. in Windows and sort of select precisely where on the screen your app is going to appear. Because before this really, I found sort of the split screen experience of basically any OS I've used to be sort of kludgy, whether it was Windows, Mac OS, iPad OS. I just really liked that you could designate where the app was going to go and not yeah. have to sort of tinker with it with fine sort of touchpad um, motions. Um, especially if you're using a not very good trackpad. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Um, and now I think with that, I think Windows by far has the better split view multitasking oh, experience man. of any of the OSs that yeah. I've been using lately. I think that's been the case for a very long time, but I, I will get into fights with Apple people about that. Uh, what you're talking about is the snap to functionality. If you hover over your window with the maximize button, you could push you could push that window to like the top left corner or the bottom right corner, or like to have it take over the you know one side of the screen. And actually I have an ultra wide monitor here too. So I see a whole other row. I see like uh, the ability to like put a window right in the middle and then put two others. Once you choose and put a window somewhere, you can also quickly start adding windows into other spots and other quadrants in your screen, which I think is really cool. Um, so I really dig that part. Sherlyn, what are your like overall thoughts on Windows 11 at this point? Hearing y'all talk about this Snap2 feature as like one of your favorites makes me feel like, and, and we've talked about this before in previous episodes of the podcast too, which is that Snap2 actually is one of the touch friendliest things that yep. Microsoft has done uh, for Windows in a long time. And it's clearly still trying to make its like touch friendly version of Windows happen, except for like not a separate version and just bake everything in. Because I think the future that Microsoft sees with PCs is that everything's going to be a touch screen. Mm -hmm. Which is very different from, I believe, Mac, right? Because until today, y'all don't have a, a touchscreen well, MacBook. <laughs> it's uh, it's very, it's very, it's like different war strategies, right? Because yeah, the iPhone and iPad were the things that made touchscreens popular among consumer electronics. But Apple has always had this like clear line between its mobile devices and the desktop stuff, right? And yeah. they they have not, at most, they're giving us iPad apps, you know, uh, and iPhone apps in Mac OS. But beyond that, we're not getting touchscreens or anything just yet. Uh, I don't, how do you feel about that, Dana? Because I know you're primarily a Mac user now, but you're using, you've been testing a Windows device with a touchscreen, the Surface Pro 8. Did, did that feel different or better, you know, as a desktop experience in your MacBook? I loved it. And I mean, I think for me, um, I, I, I don't think this is specific to Microsoft. I, I would make the same criticism sometimes of Apple. I think when I receive a device like the Surface Pro to review, I think in a sense, sometimes Microsoft oversells the pen experience. Mm -hmm. Not to say it's for no one, but I think for me, at least, the more relevant thing is I use the touchscreen ad hoc um, when I least expect to. So I'm typing on the keyboard, and then for whatever reason, it's more convenient to just 
yeah. reach up with my index finger and tap the screen. And I think that doesn't make for a very exciting demo if you're um, Microsoft and you're unveiling these devices at a new event, but it's sort of those smaller um, unexpected moments. Like I can't explain why in a certain moment it's more convenient to use my finger, yeah. um, even if the trackpad is otherwise perfectly reliable. But um, that's actually, I enjoy it a lot. And that's the more relevant use case for me. Not that the pen isn't fun, but um, mm -hmm. we're not all pen people. <laughs> I, I think the main problem with the pen and, and the use case you're thinking of, Dana, I, I mean, for me anyway, is, is when I'm signing a document and I have to, to randomly draw something on the screen, a trackpad just sucks for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I, But the thing is, I wouldn't buy a pen for $130 just to sign the occasional document. Right. And especially if, um, at least if you don't buy the type, the signature type cover with the Pro 8, you don't have an onboard slot that charges the, the mm -hmm. uh, Slim Pen and the Slim Pen 2, I guess. Slim Pen um, 2, yeah. Yeah, which we can talk about in a little bit because it <laughs> it's all haptic and shiz. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's why I like uh, something like Samsung's Galaxy Book uh, because it has the S Pen on board. That's mm -hmm. the book. 360 the book flex not the book pro um book pro yeah. is a separate it doesn't have a holder but anyway I, i'm shaking I, I my head because of out. course uh Shirlin will bring up the <laughs> samsung galaxy book like of course of course um <laughs> I, I, the thing about the pen and i think this is what flemixes a lot of people too maybe it's why microsoft does include it with the surfaces because i think they used to with the early models if i was back in like college right and sitting through a lecture and you're taking notes and the notes aren't things that you can just like type into your screen so like when i was taking um a logic course for philosophy or something like that's symbols and it's things you're writing down and like or if you're taking a math course or do you just want to like draw diagrams a computer is not the best way to do that and i know a lot of people who have like a notebook nearby and they sketch down notes and stuff too for those folks having like an onboard way to just quickly jot things down, not be constrained by a keyboard and trackpad. I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, it's not for everybody, but I am, I am glad somebody like Microsoft is like actually focusing on those inputs. Um, but yeah, any, any other broad thoughts about Windows 11, Dana? Because I want to talk about your Pro 8 thoughts as well about the actual machine. Um, well, we covered multitasking and just... Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's funny, I showed Windows 11 to my boyfriend, who's an avid um, Windows user. The first thing he did was he went into the settings. <laughs> like, it was sort of Nice like, settings, yeah. I don't think he's the only Windows user who would do this. I do think mm -hmm. there is, like, a Windows personality. But the first thing he did, he was it was like he was less concerned with the aesthetics, but he wanted to go into the settings and make sure that um, everything was still there as if like, right. I don't know what he was worried about that Microsoft would like stealthily steal away some of the options. They did do that like, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> it was like an inspection of the options to make sure that mm -hmm. Microsoft hadn't somehow dumbed down the settings menu from one version to another. And he seemed mm -hmm. satisfied enough and then like handed the machine back to me. And I was like, Oh, you don't care about the hardware. And it was like, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um all of which is to say, and I mean, I think you made this point in your review, I think, um, I don't think this is a monumental upgrade over the previous version. I think a lot of the changes are nice and welcome, and I think they add up to something fulsome, but it, it does not feel like um, mm -hmm. a huge, huge um, departure from the previous experience. It's uh, So I basically sketched out a little Aaron Sorkin like meeting in my review because this is really how I saw it happening. Two years ago, Microsoft announced Windows 10X. We've talked about it here on the podcast. That was supposed to be their, you know, fancy dual screened operating system. We'd have dual screen PCs like the Surface Neo. Dell was building them. Like everybody was working on them. Mm. I think then the pandemic happened and a lot of like hardware design really slowed down. And last year, Microsoft announced like, okay, okay, Windows 10X uh, only for single screen devices, you know, uh, really thin laptops and stuff like that. And then earlier this year, they were like, no, 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 um, we're not releasing Windows 10X. I'm just going to forget about that. And then like two weeks later, Satya Nadella is just like, hey, guys, we, we got a whole new version of Windows. Can you believe it? It, it just came out of nowhere. So I do feel like this like minor update or this like what, what would have been like a side update to Windows 10 ended up being this overall update they're pushing to everybody, um, mainly because it is so design focused. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but it does feel uh, 
it feels like they're taking advantage of the current momentum of the PC market. Every, a lot of people are working from home. A lot of people are still doing school from home. So people need new PCs um, and they're more interested in buying stuff at this point. It just doesn't feel like, uh, I have a feeling at the beginning of this year, which was what, nine months ago, Windows 11 as a concept probably didn't even exist. I think they were looking at all of this work they put into Windows 10X and be like, uh, uh, what, what do I do with this? We can make this a Windows 10 service pack, but nobody really cares about that. But if you just make it 11, just go to 11, all of a sudden it gets news. Uh, it gets me spending my whole weekend reviewing it, um, things like that. So I think Microsoft kind of got us, but... That, that's the big thing. Um, people have been asking me, like, should they rush out and upgrade if they can? I don't think so. I think you should just wait a little because uh, even on my desktop right now, which involved me doing, <laughs> I had to do some command line work. I had to turn on Secure Boot and the TPM 2.0 module. I had to convert my disk from an MBR disk to a GPT disk in the freaking command line, like uh, like I was in 1995, um, because Secure Boot wouldn't see this old type. Uh, there are a lot of like annoying things happening right now. When I boot my desktop, this just started happening like two days ago. Windows 11 launches, it kind of looks at the login screen, then it reboots, <laughs> and then it lets me log in. So there, there are weird things happening, folks. Don't rush out and upgrade. There are some exclusive features like direct storage, which is going to make games load faster. Um, and like uh, that's going to be exclusive to Windows 11, but a lot of things won't be. Auto HDR, the new store app, the new Xbox app are all going to be on Windows 10. So this is a weird point that we're on right now. Um, but you know what? Shoot us any questions you guys have about Windows 11. Check out my review. It is uh, very long. And we, yeah. have a, uh, we have a video that's going to be going up later this week too, hopefully. But let's move on to like the actual Surface devices. Dana, you reviewed the Surface Pro 8. How long has it been since you've like spent a lot of time with the Surface? It's, I've definitely skipped a few generations. I mean... Mm -hmm. um, I've taken on new responsibilities and gadget over the years. Yeah. And obviously I've been able to really, and this has been great, hand over PC coverage to you and Sherlyn. So I've definitely skipped a few generations on um, on the surface, but I mean, rest assured to the viewers out there, I did my homework um, ahead of time. I also came to you guys if I had any um, questions along the way. Um, so I feel we got there in the end, but yeah, for me, this was uh, first time in a little while really spending uh, considerable time with the surface. Did you like yeah. it? Yeah. You, well, what are I your did. What are your yeah. thoughts? Because this is the yeah, biggest Surface I mean, update since like Surface Laptop Four or Surface uh, Pro Four, I think, basically. So, yeah. I felt like I was in for a treat. Yeah. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time first rereading um, um, our review of the Surface Pro Seven from last year, and I mean, I know one of our few complaints was that the design at the time felt dated. So this is. I, I don't. I think it's a little inaccurate to call it a brand new design just because it takes cues from the Surface Pro X, mm -hmm. which itself came out two years ago. But I mm -hmm. think in terms of the flagship Surface Pro, it's still a newer design than what you guys had experienced um, just a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, but the hard hardware, it feels it feels premium. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, even like the snap that the kickstand makes when you snap it into place, something about the sound even sounds... <laughs> It's um, a great experience, both on a flat surface like a desk. I was able to use it on my lap successfully as well. Um,
actually what's enabled out of the box. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's battery life. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, once So the Hertz, the refresh rate talk, that refers to like how fast the screen is refreshing and the yep. higher the number, the more organic and fluid it is. Like, so it looks like real life. And we've talked about this before in the show. Uh, these devices, the Surface Pro 8 and the Surface Laptop Studio that I'm gonna be talking about, are the first like consumer PCs or certainly Windows PCs that have this that aren't gaming laptops. And I think mm -hmm. that's a, uh, it certainly, it makes a big difference to me. Um, I know the iPad Pro has had it too, but you know, that's a that's a fancy tablet. I, I don't know if I'd call that a full-fledged laptop just yet, uh, even with the case. Uh, but Dana, so I, I think what's cool about the Pro 8 is that it has a bigger screen than before, because before they were like 12.1, it was like a little smaller than like a 13-inch Ultrabook, but now it's like fully competitive. It has a you know, a 13 screen it has a 120 hertz display. Uh, I still, I like the type covers. Um, the keyboard is good. The trackpad has always been kind of iffy. Uh, how is the overall experience? Would you use this over a like MacBook Air or an XPS 13? Um, so the problem with that comparison, and I noted this in the review, is that the price is so similar. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think um, this this version of the Surface Pro addresses a number of the complaints that you guys had mm -hmm. last year. Um, obviously, the keyboard is still not included in the price, which remains a sticking point for me. It's 180 bucks, just so you know. So, um, but they Oof. also raised the starting price, and they did that both by eliminating a base Core i3 configuration that had cost 750 bucks last year, and yeah. So, but they also raised the price of the base Core i5 configuration by a few hundred bucks. Huh. So what you're looking at is a starting price of 1100 with the keyboard, which is 180. So that brings the starting price to, um, to 1280. And um, uh, it's just, um, that puts it in, in ultra portable laptop territory. And yeah. I think that really raises the bar for recommending the Surface Pro. It's not that I recommend it. I don't recommend it. And in fact, if you look at the score, I think I scored at 85. So that's a pretty darn good score for an Engadget mm -hmm. review. It's just like the higher the price, the, either the, the higher the bar for recommending it and the more caveats I have to attach. And it's like, mm -hmm. eh, yeah. like do at that price, do I necessarily recommend it for over an XPS 13, which we love, yeah. and which also has a touchscreen? Not but, for everybody. Yeah, you know? not um, for everybody. It well, XPS 13 does not go into like tablet mode unless you get the two in one, which is a little more. Yeah. It's a little more expensive, and it's like a heavy tablet. That's like a three mm -hmm. and a half pound tablet. I bought my wife one, and she loves it. But you know, she never really uses it in tablet mode. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you do you think like the market for the Surface Pro is kind of getting there, Dana? Do you think like, especially for students? I can imagine like when I went to college, right? In two thousand one, I built myself a desktop PC because laptops back then just were not super capable. You know, like the first Titanium PowerBook came out, I think. But even then, like that was, it was it was not much of a powerhouse. It just looked really nice. Um, do you think a student or somebody you know who uses their computer maybe differently than we do? Uh, you know, as working professionals, do you think they would like a Pro 8? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think certainly how you intend to use the touchscreen is, yeah. is part of it. I mean, if like me, you only use the touchscreen ad hoc, you know, when your finger is convenient, you're going to get a similar experience out of the XPS 13. And then it comes down to factors like battery life and how much weight you can tolerate. I mean, one thing about mm -hmm. the Surface Pro that I think can't be underestimated is um, just how light it is in the bag. Um, yeah. This was a big improvement over my MacBook, um, over, you know, uh, the MacBook Pro that I normally carry, the 13 inch. Sure. And I mean, it's the, with the keyboard, it's, um, it's lighter, but even the charger itself is so much smaller and more compact. So um, I think that's something to consider as well. And for me is the main reason why I would consider this over a traditional machine. But even then I'm thinking of it in terms of, 
I don't necessarily know that I want the Surface Pro as my main machine. Yeah. Um, but as an auxiliary machine, yes, like over an iPad Pro any day, like it's the thing I want to take on vacation or away from my main machine. But at mm -hmm. this price, again, you need to be able to afford a second machine. Yeah. Or even a first. <laughs> That's uh, that's always been the thing with the Pro 8, but I do think like, especially for people who have Windows machines and you have a desktop or something, you still want a portable machine. You want something to take away. So I totally see that use case there. And uh, everybody go check out Dana's review of the Surface Pro 8. I want to quickly move on to like the Laptop Studio, which I think is the like weirdest Transformer-like looking thing from the Surface event. And uh, basically, RIP Surface Book because yep. we've talked about the Surface Book and its design issues and the fact that Microsoft had to stuff the CPUs and all the hardware, like pretty much all the PC hardware behind the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, when I, reviewed the, when I reviewed the Surface Book 3, I was like, uh, this is bad. You can't, you can't sell a laptop for $2,500 with such a slow CPU. And it's because of this weird design that Microsoft was, basically did with the book series. So they are back with another weird design. And <laughs> I have to say, I like it. Um, yeah. I like what they're doing. I like the way it feels. Um, go check out my full review, but it, like, it feels good. Uh, I have the four pound i7 model um, holding it in my hand. It feels very solid. That weird like sandwich stacked uh, bottom design. I, it doesn't really bother me when it's like on my lap, but it is a thing that makes me think like, man, if they had just, gone all the way and just been a little thicker uh maybe we could have more ports maybe we could mm. have more than two USB C ports maybe i could get my micro sd card slot back or something uh the killer feature of this laptop is that tilting screen so you can pull the screen out for uh, towards you it'll rest between the keyboard and the trackpad you could pull it all the way down it'll turn to like a mini easel and uh one thing microsoft i don't know if microsoft showed this off at the event Sherlin, but mm -hmm. Like a normal, like a convertible uh, 360 degree laptop, you can also mm -hmm. flip the screen all the way around and yep. just mount it on the back so yep. that the keyboard is behind it and the screen is just like up, which is really good if you're doing a presentation or something. Did they show that off or is that just like a weird thing? They did. That, okay. I mean, I, I tried it. They didn't like yeah. show it off, That, but that's the configuration I had most trouble with it in though, yeah. because when you... I don't know if you experienced this in your review too. This, this hit, the, the screen just kind of popped out of the hinge when I was trying to push it back down in yeah. this configuration. Did that happen for you too? Uh, no, I don't think it did. But uh, okay. I, I think you learn, you kind of learn like how yeah. to manage the screen because I also had some instances where it has this really nice uh, one finger pull up screen module. So mm. like the hinge itself is, it's strong, but easy enough for you to just like open up your laptop without too much struggle. But if you push too much on the top of the screen as yep. you're opening it up, it'll like pop out. Right. So like, you know, that's the thing. You just kind of learn to live with it. Uh, my main thing, you know, talking with Microsoft, they said this hinge has gone through a lot of work. Uh, the hinge itself is kind of like unique because we just haven't seen this before on a Microsoft device. We've talked about seeing similar things on the HP Spectre uh, Folio. Mm -hmm. And also some Acer laptops, the Concept D easel, yep. I believe, also had exactly. this. Um, but I look at this screen, I'm like, okay, this is durable. I could live with this. And then I look at my three-year-old daughter and the way she, like, <laughs> plays with all of my electronics and stuff. And I'm like, oh, no, nope. this is bad. Like, it's bad in... It's bad like to be around a kid because there are a lot of pinch points. So you got to watch out for things where like kids could pinch their fingers, but also she could try to do what I'm doing, like yanking the screen and just yank it off the table or something mm -hmm. too. So there are things you got to watch out for with kids in general and electronics, but this one could be a particular pain. Um, I do like the fact that they basically brought over the Surface Book keyboard. Uh, feels really good. Pretty much the best keyboard you can get in a laptop because it's so like so... Uh, the key travels so deep. It's just so satisfying. Um, and what else? What else? It also has a 120 hertz screen. Both this one and the Surface Pro 8 have Dolby mm -hmm. Vision on the screens too. So they have HDR, which is great for video and some games. Um, and it still looks as fluid as the Surface Pro 8. The one thing, the one thing I'm really annoyed about and that really knocked this thing a couple points down in our review is that Microsoft once again limited themselves power-wise. It only has up to a, it only has quad core processors. It is using Intel's 11th gen H35 chips, which uh, are 35 watts. They're more powerful than what was in the book three last year, but mm. the XPS 13 has had a six core CPU option for two years. You know, the Razer Blade 14, which I reviewed this year has eight core chips. 
I, what are you doing, Microsoft? Because this thing starts at like $2,300. So that's like my main issue. Yeah. If you want something with a weird screen and it's a little unique and, oh, you can put the pen right underneath and, you know, uh, draw really easily, that's nice. Um, if you want something for the same exact price, it'll probably last you more than two or three years. The razor blade is right there, you know, yeah. and it has... It has pretty much everything. I don't think it has HDR, but it has like so much more power so that somebody who's doing like video editing or content editing or 3D creation or something, that would be the thing they go to. The Surface Studio is more for like maybe students, maybe people in education and people who just like are doing lighter computing work, but don't need a ton of power. I don't, do you have any opinion with what Microsoft has done with this, Dana? With the, the power management? Well, with the, the Surface Studio in general, like the I the laptop did, studio, the laptop studio, yeah, because the Surface Laptop Studio is the full name. Yes, <laughs> um, because you looked at some of the book stuff like back in the day too, I believe, and it was a design that basically was not long for this earth. Um, <laughs> do you think this was a smart shift for Microsoft with the laptop studio? Um, I would want to spend more time with it. Um, mm -hmm. I I think I've tested the surface book maybe in its first or very second generation i recall um, yeah so my memory of it then um i don't want to spend too much time boring you guys down uh, memory lane but i remember it being some of the best hardware i had ever tested yeah um it i think what the line that i remember sticking out in my review was um even my mom thought it was a nice laptop. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I think Microsoft PR at the time kind of latched onto that line. They were like, oh, even yeah. Mona Wallman likes it. But um, <laughs> it was nice hardware and it was also like impractically expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems somewhat true now, still. Yep, yep, same story. Yeah. Same story. I mean, less so. I think the book when it came out was really expensive. And mm -hmm. I also know people who bought some of that first gen book hardware. There were a lot of hardware issues. Like Microsoft did not fully figure out the syncing between the screen tablet portion oh. and the dock. And like there were points where like people would try to release the screen, it wouldn't work, or it would constantly crash because there were driver errors between the GPU in the in the dock or the GPU on the screen. Like it was kind of a mess, and I think uh, at some point they threw up their hands. Maybe they read our review last year where I literally just said, uh, Microsoft, there are other ways to move screens. Yep. You, can, you can figure out something. There are so many other convertibles on the market, and uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they listened to us from last time. Uh, so Laptop Studio, it's a really nice machine. I would not go into getting it if, uh, if you want something that's like the most bang for your buck. But hey, check out my full review. Uh, we but also that reviewed. Be a theme. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a theme across the line. I might be yeah. bringing yeah. you to the same segue that you were you were just mm -hmm. making. But like this idea that Microsoft didn't totally nail the price seems to be a recurring point in yep. all of our reviews this season. Mm -hmm. It's a point that I made, that um, you made, and I think you were mm -hmm. about to mention Nate's review of the Go mm -hmm. Three, right? Nate's review of the Go Three. I mean, yeah. it's uh, it's interesting, and I also wonder if like is this is one thing that Microsoft does to purposefully not be too competitive too, because I saw some interviews with uh, with Panos and some mm -hmm. other folks where they're like, hey, we're Microsoft. We are building this platform that other PC makers are using. Uh, how do we be Microsoft, but also compete against Dell and Asus and HP, right? And I'm w wondering if like, they could afford to be more competitive with the pricing. They where, could. where, where have yeah. I heard this before? Huh? Mm -hmm. I wonder if the Pixel Book and the <laughs> like they're also super expensive for no good reason. Exactly. Google also exactly. does similar things. Yeah. Um, I mean, except the like, yeah, say, mm -hmm. the one thing I would say, arguing with myself and maybe speaking on behalf of the commenters whose comments I can't see right now, but I'm just <laughs> guessing that some people have this this thought is like, you know. Um, I think because we assume that people are shopping either for Windows devices or Apple devices, like we don't make this price argument as much anymore about Macs, just because we assume that like people are com basically comparison shopping between the different Macs. So it's true. It's true. Um, we put a little right. less price pressure on the MacBook, MacBook and MacBook Pro lines when we're reviewing them. But if it's something like the Surface Pro or the Surface Laptop Studio, it's like we assume that... Um, the user is comparison shopping among any number of Windows brands. And so there's a higher bar of sort of for the, the thing being worth it for the price yep. that it is. Yep. 
So that's me counter arguing myself when I say that Microsoft didn't really nail the price in any yeah. of these three. Scenarios. Our 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 audience is agreeing with you, J. Mike. They totally in agree. The chat says exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, totally. It's a very good point mm -hmm. that Microsoft has more competition in the space too. So mm -hmm. I don't know. And also competition that they are directly working with. So yes. it's like a weird, sticky situation. Like they can't they can't be fully aggressive against everybody because they need everybody to sell Windows and all of their other technical achievements. Uh, I want to quickly mention Nick Ingram's review of the mm -hmm. Surface Go 3, which is the cheapest Surface and the latest version of the like tiny 10-inch Surface. Uh, it is still $400. It still requires uh. you to buy the type cover separately. This is what we talk about when we talk about price. Um, so you have to spend another $100 on the type cover. OK, a $500 Windows tablet PC. That seems nice, except uh, that lowest model is like usually very, very slow, um, has very little RAM. Like It's not a usable PC, I think, for a lot of people. So OK, let, let's bump up the configuration a little. Uh, how about a Core i3 with 8 gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage? That's mm -hmm. going to cost you $630, plus you have to add the keyboard again. So then you're up to at least $730, maybe more if you want the Pro-type cover. And at that point, just get a used XPS 13 or something, you know, like that is my advice for a lot of people huh. look into older hardware, look into sales of older hardware, look into refurbished units. Uh, the, my, my like best little tech gift, uh, I bought my wife an XPS 13 two and one refurbished. Um, it was great. It was great for the price. By the time it came to us, it had 32 gigabytes of Ram. Wow. I only, I ordered 16, but it had 32. Someone like, had already, yeah. I'm not going to complain, right? Like yeah. it, it, that's what that's the stock they had to ship out. So you've got a lot of options when it comes to like inexpensive PCs. I think the Go is a really cool idea, but man, I wish uh, I wish Microsoft could do more with it. Um, and it's just that I don't think it's going to be a super successful thing. Dana, do you have any parting thoughts on the Surface Line or Windows 11 or Sherlin? Like, do you, do you, what do you guys think about everything happening now? Mm -hmm. Go, Dana. Uh, it's um... The Surface Go reminds, the idea of like a baby Surface reminds me a little bit of the Surface RT. Exactly, um, yeah. And we all know how that went. I mean, obviously it's been, gosh, almost a decade um, since the first round. So, I mean, we can maybe put a little more faith in Microsoft to sort of um, execute on a more affordably priced um, Surface device. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's... I'm a little disappointed. I, I I saw the score on Nate's review. It was in the high 70s. What was yeah. it? 77? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and, um, am looking. 77. Uh, yes. Yeah, I was expecting a little more progress on Microsoft's um, part all these years later, if the vision was like Surface Lite or sur Baby Surface, whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, Baby Surface. surface super <laughs> Surface, yeah. Um, so, but I think Nate's review is fair. I think the device could be for someone, but it is a bit more of a stretch to recommend this than maybe either of the two Surface devices that you and I tested. Absolutely, absolutely. But again, in the in the pantheon of like Windows tablets and what you can find for around 500 bucks, there, are, there actually aren't many, but Windows is not the best like tablet OS either. So I, I think that's kind of why they're going back to it. Uh, even with the, after the Surface RT, the line was just Surface blank and Surface Pro. Right, and now with the Surface Go, they're basically kind of trying to bring back the blank, the like plain Jane Surface line. And uh, maybe, I think the key is like, if they can make an ARM chip work well with Windows, finally, uh, uh, that could be a good Surface Go down the line. Like cheaper, cheaper, still capable, still energy, like inner, energy efficient and whatnot. I still need to test the, uh, the Surface Pro X with Windows 11 and to see if like, they said software emulation is here, for older Windows apps, we, we got to see how all that works. Any parting thoughts, Sherlyn, about any of this hardware or Windows 11? It just sounds like more of the same. I mean, the most <laughs> interesting thing was the redesign of the Pro 8 and then the Laptop Studio, and then those seem to still have their constraints. I, I Yeah, I mean, I, I, meh overall, I guess. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. And uh, go check out my full review, folks. Uh, we're going to have a video up soon. Um, it is, it's Windows 10 with a new coat of paint and a whole new load of frustrations. Uh, I didn't fully talk about like my multitasking issues, but I, I'm not a fan of the new taskbar. I'm looking at it right now and I just wish I could see like what each window was already without hovering above it. Um, so let me know what your solutions for dealing with that are, folks. Like I'm, I'm just leaning more on uh, Windows plus tab 
more than ever or alt tab. Um, that's kind of the way I'm trying to survive, but I have the same problems on Macs too. So maybe I'm just bad at windows management. Stay tuned. Okay. Let me, let me wrap this up. Okay. Check out our full review windows 11 and all the surface devices over in gadget and Dana, thank you so much for joining us. I hope to have you on again. Hey, thanks guys. Have a good Next podcast. Time. Hi. Okay. Dana, you can save your audio and send that to Ben, and we are going to switch over to uh, other news. Other yeah, news. Can, Dana, and let me just send that drop me this. Point. Oh, okay. Dana's gone. Dana's gone. Okay, I'll tell. But give us a second. Give me a second, folks. I just want yes. Carissa to have the. I was going to give her the link email. to. Uh, let me give. I got it. I got okay. it. Okay. I just have it here. Okay, how are you guys doing? How's chat room doing? Thank you for bearing with us, folks. Uh, shout out to everyone. Jonathan Anderson had to go for a meeting and came back and then was glad to find we're up and running. Yes, thank you. Yes, for we are. Back. Yes, we're actually up and running. Thanks for Yay. everybody for sticking with us. Uh, we can't confirm that it was because of the new operating system we were just talking about, but eh, there's a possibility. We were just talking about all the problems that it had. Oh, uh, right. Should we plow through? Go ahead. Uh, let's go. Carissa has a thing. Yep. Do you want to take the lead, Sherlyn, or shall I jump I in? I could. Yeah, go for it. Could. Yeah, yeah, because right. you're starting with Google, so go for it. Yep. All right. Ben, we ready? We're ready. Okay. It wasn't just all about Microsoft this week, okay, y'all? There was also Google Land stuff, and I will be the first to admit that I give Samsung a lot of crap for having way too many <laughs> events, but uh, uh -huh. excuse me, Google, excuse me, but uh, it had an event also this week, which was earlier on rumored to be the Pixel event, which I can't say that I definitely knew when the Pixel event was going to be, but I knew it wasn't going to be October 5th. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> October 5th, however, this week was Google's big sustainability media event. It wasn't streamed to the public. It was really just a big like um, showcase of news and new updates that uh, Google is bringing to its products and services. And I'm just going to run you all through uh, all of them really quickly and then do a little bit of a slightly deeper dive on, on the ones that pique my interest the most. So first of all, I mean, search results, you're going to see a whole bunch more info around sustainability. So when you're booking your next flight, your next hotel, you're going to see information on their um, carbon neutrality or the, the carbon emissions, the carbon mm -hmm, footprint mm -hmm. of each flight. And you can even drill down to each seat. Like I didn't, I mean, I don't think this is really fair to do, but, a, you know, a first class seat costs more and a first class seat takes up more space. So if you're taking a first class seat, the carbon footprint of that will be higher compared to economy. But I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. like for me, not very fair. The entire plane is anyway. Yep, carb yep. That, that sort of result you can see when you're booking your next flight, your next hotel, you'll see their waste reduction or their energy efficiency uh, policies, mm -hmm. their that, shopping, all of that. That's stuff. really so, cool. Well, let me just say this, like yeah. this is the beginning of the world where we have to be more aware, right, of exactly. everything we do, like the trips we take, places we stay, if you do air travel, we have to be aware of the carbon cost of all of that. And yes. maybe eventually the incentives can be like, okay, if you take a train here or something, if you take like yeah. a low carbon way, maybe you can save some money. Maybe you'll get a special discount. Uh, I, I'm like, that's a good way for the yes. so-called free market to kind of like stabilize and incentivize people to like, you know, hurt the environment less. That would be nice. Yeah. Especially since you, what a great point, right? Like Google mm -hmm. is the first way or place people see the world so much right now that like this information being put in front of your face when you're searching yeah. for these things will remind you that these are things to take into consideration too. Um, and so, as Mark Dell mentioned, by the way, let's get it yes. for every gadget too. Let's get, so how much did this iPhone cost me? How much, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so okay, so it's coming also to shopping, but specifically mm -hmm. Google is starting with um, appliances that generally are a bit more um, energy inefficient, a bit more uh, like things like a, a heat pump or a water heater, that sort of thing that will mm -hmm. um, impact the environment more. They're going to show you better alternatives in the shopping results or also let you see a way to compare the carbon cost of these things. So there's shopping updates. There's also like Devendra said, uh, you know, 
trying to show you how it would be better to use a more uh, green uh, vehicle or a mm -hmm. mode of transportation. So two things around that. One is uh, when you're shopping for an electric vehicle, Google wants to make it easier for you. So they want to show you compatible charging stations near you for this specific vehicle if you're looking at it. Uh, they were going to surface some rebates that you might be eligible hmm. for if you're shopping for this vehicle. They're doing that, I mean, across a lot of things. So, so this is big changes coming to search, shopping, maps is also getting um, uh, a light navigation mode that's built just for cycling. Um, and it'll basically kind of allow you to hear your turn-by-turn -turn directions without having to X out of that uh, entire route. Uh, so you can track your progress along your route while the maps is still on it. And, and, and while your screen is off, you'll still hear your directions. It'll tell you what elevation is coming up, all that sort of thing. They really want to encourage people I, I, Google does think that like giving the this navigation mode will encourage cycling more, uh, in addition to also showing you what um, rent like the the ride share bikes are available in your area is teamed up with Bird and and some other scooter providers to show you what uh, is available near you. So that's another way that Google is uh, improving, trying to make you more aware of the environmentally uh, friendlier alternatives mm -hmm. to what you're searching for. So that's search, right? But then what I'm more intrigued by are the two other things that Google also announced at this event. So one is Nest Renew. Nest Renew is a program. It's not hardware. Mm -hmm. It's just a program that will... Basically, it's all about the fact that your power grid at any given time is a mix of carbon or fossil and clean energy. Mm. Earlier in the morning, for example, it might have more solar energy in the mix. On a windier day, there might be more wind energy on your grid. But how are you taking advantage of that? I mean, none of us are really taking, I, I'm not, I don't know about, I don't want to assume everyone doesn't know this, but I didn't know this until, so, until the Nest people brief me on this. And- uh -huh. What happens with Nest Renew? It's a free program. It's opt-in. And if you have a compatible Nest thermostat, which is um, three models, I'll, you can read my article on that for the yeah, details. Yeah. Um, Google actually has worked with energy providers and a lot of like grids and, and, and energy service providers to be able to see when the grid is cleaner mm -hmm. and, and has more of a mix of wind, solar, or hydro energy, and then just kind of set your therm like have your thermostat go uh cool a little earlier or start heating a little earlier when mm -hmm. the green energy is more available as opposed to later in the day and and that's just what the thermostats can do they're also going to show you a monthly report and like a just a general interface where you can see what times of day the energy coming into your home is cleaner so you can make the choices to do things like run the laundry earlier in the day run your dishwasher when it's more yep. solar powered that sort of thing and use more clean energy. So like, to me, that was like, wait, why haven't I already been doing this? Like, mm -hmm. what? Anyway. It, it is, I will say, um, it, it is like one of the first pro tips in, in energy yes. usage, Sherlyn. So I'm glad, I'm glad Google schooled you. I'm glad this feature exists because I'm glad yes. like we need this awareness out there. But hey, folks, everybody, you don't, you don't need an S thermostat to know this. Uh, you know, cool down your house in the morning, heat up your house in the morning, stay, do stuff in off peak times because it's usually better. It's not just yes. like the green stuff. It's like when the demand is higher, cost is higher too. Yeah. It's partly about peak management for yeah. sure too, because uh, there's a premium level of Nest Renew that I'm not going to go into because I think it's <laughs> a little much, but um, yeah. but the basic level of Nest Renew, I, what I like is that the insight it gives into your specific apartment, what time of day the energy is cleaner for you, it, mm -hmm. it makes a big difference. Like I, I can go by, yes, like street wisdom, I guess, but it <laughs> might not necessarily apply to like, I don't, I mean, I mean, my state doesn't have the most like solar in the area i have maybe more wind than anything else so i don't know mm -hmm. anyway give it a look and davinder's right yeah. like definitely make more conscious decisions about when we, you're using these energy uh intensive mm -hmm. appliances in your home we should know more about our grids how about that like we For should sure. know and you should know like uh hey if uh, if your power mostly comes from uh, a coal firing plant which still exists oh. and uh it, it's a whole annoying thing your tesla is powered by coal so you got to <laughs> think about day, yeah. <laughs> you got to think about those things. Like, okay, if you really want to be renewable, maybe get some solar setup, maybe get a home battery or something. 
there's yeah, there's a lot of stuff we have to do infrastructure wise. Anything else from Google, Sherlyn? Because I yeah. feel like you're just excited with Google News at this point. The last thing that Google did that is exciting but also unsettling is uh, the company also announced that it is working on this AI research project that would let AI manage traffic lights to reduce pollution. Yeah. Nothing can go wrong with that plan. The, yeah. The, I'm just remembering all the Tesla accidents right now. Uh -huh. But anyway, uh, what the, the uh, what Google is trying to do is that in it, it's thinking, and this is not wrong, is that like a time spent idling, like cars mm -hmm. spent idling at stoplights and intersections and stuff like that, it's actually a big contributor to pollution in the street level, um, and at the street level, at the same, uh, in addition to like wasted time, right? Like that, that's a small frustration for sure. But like, think about all the fuel you're wasting, think about all the exhaust that's pumping into the, the environment at the same time. Um, so a lot of that is caused by inefficient traffic lights, according to yeah. Google. So it's actually already run pilot tests in four locations in Israel, and they found through their pilots that like there's an overall 10 to 20 percent reduction in fuel wastage mm -hmm. and and just general improvement in efficiency. So now Google is expanding uh, the tests uh, and starting them in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I know. And, and I mean, it says it's also talking with cities around the world, but like no yeah. other details have been given. We don't know how the system works. We don't know how many cars were at those intersections. We don't know how busy those intersections were. Yeah, um, it, it assumes people pay attention to the lights too, because down here where I live, people <laughs> look at a red light and like, uh, that's a suggestion, not a uh, not something <laughs> you legally follow. So, you know. Yeah, for sure. This is meant for like specific cities. And this is also going to feed into the idea of like a smart city that's eventually all managed by like cues and feedbacks from vehicles mm -hmm. and like lights and like sensors on the roads and stuff like that. So so this is part of it. And we're all working <laughs> towards that. Uh, I'm just not sure I would fully rely on AI to understand yeah. how traffic lights should behave. I don't know. But anyway, it, that it was... depends. It depends. Like when they say AI, a lot of these folks mean yeah. magic algorithms that right. we don't know fully how they work. But if it's more like, hey, can the traffic lights see if a car is here and if that lane's completely empty? Like, can it just do that rather than being on a right. timer? I do feel like could be better or detect pedestrians and stuff. Eventually, cars should have sensors. Like, cars should be able to communicate within the sea of other cars. So, right. Maybe we'll get there eventually. What else is up with Google? One day. Well, <laughs> Google's that was the sustainability event, aka the not pixel event. But Google did announce this week the pixel event is happening October 19th. So we now have a date. People can stop guessing and speculating. Uh, October 19th is when we'll hear all about the Pixel 6. And of course, I'm pretty sure we will have some sort of live stream here on the Engadget YouTube channel. So make sure you guys come back for that. We will watch it with you, react live with you too. Um, and then also this week, Android 12 was just out of nowhere suddenly publicly released to the AOSP channel, the Android <laughs> Open Source Project channel. I was like, cool. uh, very, uh, very exciting. I guess I what? Thanks for the heads up, bro. So I, I asked Google and they were like, yeah, no, we consider this the full public release. I'm like, all right, great. But, but <laughs> we just caveat, forgot to tell you. Yeah. yeah. And the caveat is that like, there are still going to be pixel exclusive features that, mm -hmm. uh, or pixel first features that we won't see until the pixel six launches, I am assuming. So, so we still have some Android 12 surprises that we haven't heard. Now, uh, we've tested Android 12 for a long time now in the beta, so so none of this will be surprising to you, um, to everyone basically. But yeah, I mean, if you've been, we've been talking a lot about Windows 11 and how you shouldn't upgrade at the second it drops. <laughs> I would like hold I off. did. Yeah. yeah, I know. I would hold off on the Android 12 for now. And I, I mean, I don't think it's even fully ready to everyone yet. I mean, your OEMs have to be the ones to be like, hey, here's your Android mm -hmm. 12 update. And I'm sure they're working on finding a way to make it very stable and compatible with their versions of software. So um, basically what this means is that you'll be able to get Android 12 pretty soon, pretty, pretty soon. Um, and then, yeah, stay tuned for the Pixel 6 event. There, that That's my update from Google land, y'all. This week has been, has been a honkster of a Google week. Um, but there have been other news, right? Not There's just been Google. Others. Let me, and, let me jump into that. I just face? dropped a story into you that uh, I, I should have put in this morning too. So just FYI, uh, we're going to jump into some stuff and we'll talk about Facebook folks around 1130 Eastern. So we're just going to get through a bunch of things. Okay. <clears throat> 
Let's move on to some other news. And a uh, big thing that happened this week is Twitch mm. was hacked. Like a big, Lord. big hack. And uh, as of this morning that we're recording this, uh, Twitch is saying it was a massive, it was a server configuration change that basically opened up uh, its uh, its servers to malicious users and they were able to take some data. Uh, they say that uh, there's no indication that login credentials um they say that there's no indication login credentials, mm. passwords, um, credit card numbers, things like that were taken. The Twitch doesn't even store credit card numbers, so that's good. good. But they have like reset password, reset stream keys, and things like that. So if you've had issues, if you have a Twitch account, you may have to do some work to get it back. Um, this kind of explains like what was going on with Twitch this week. It is funny too because we're going to talk about the uh, the Facebook outage yep. that happened this week as well yep. too. Is definitely interesting that we're starting to see like these big things happening all at once um you know that there's a there's a lot to go through here um but yeah at least we have some clarification about what's going on with twitch mm -hmm. uh let's move on to a quick review by the way the nintendo switch oled review yeah, the yes. reviews are out chris yes. Nottis reviewed it for us uh she gave it an 89 she called it beautiful but not a must have. Uh, remember the big difference is that this one has a bigger, you know, seven inch, um, actually even bigger. It has a bigger screen than mm. before. Um, yeah, it has a seven inch OLED screen before it was a 6.2 inch LCD. Um, and that screen is kind of the big deal because uh, Nintendo basically shaved away the bezels. It looks like the screen is taking over. It's about the same size as the original Switch. Um, but the question is like, do you upgrade? And do you upgrade like with the knowledge that Mike, that Nintendo will probably have a new model entirely right. come next year? Um, that's the question. I, I think that's the thing for a lot of people. If you don't have a Switch already, or if you have a first gen Switch, if you have, you know, if you bought the original Switch before the battery refresh, you know, right. before like some of the server changes, uh, some of the processor changes, then maybe this would be a nice step up and you can always turn your older switch into like just something you play on your TV or something. Right. Cause then that could just be your box connected to TV. Do mm. you want to upgrade? Like, is this compelling to you, Sherlyn? Nope. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. So this is like, and this thing is 350 bucks. Good luck Boy. finding it in stock because the pre-orders like, you know, blew up immediately as they, as they typically do. Um, but the original switch is still around. It's still 300 and the switch light is still around too. So, you know, you've got options. And I think for kids, especially the switch light is still like really nice and cute and portable. Yeah. You just can't do any like TV stuff with that. Um, but I've been playing, uh, things like Eastward and some more recent games and I have like fallen back in love with my switch. Um, mm. so I am, I'm kind of tempted just to have the best overall experience with some of these games to go OLED, but I guess we will see. Let us know if you're going to go for the switch OLED and, uh, if you can find it in stock, then please let me know. Just, just <laughs> ping me on Twitter. <laughs> now, uh, this week, there was a lot of news, as we just mm -hmm. shared, but there was also this really weird thing I saw pop on the Engadget <laughs> homepage, and I was like, we <laughs> have to talk about this. <laughs> Canon made a dual RF mount fisheye lens. This mm -hmm. looks like one of those magic viewer things. I don't even know what you guys call sure. it, your childhood yeah. toy. Yeah. Okay. But with two bulging bug eye things at the end, it's it's basically <laughs> part of a new system Canon is calling EOS VR or EOS VR. It's mm. it's for making virtual reality content or AR mm. too. Um, and this is a two thousand uh, dollar dual fisheye manual lens. It's uh, RF five point two millimeters, and the aperture goes from f two dot eight to f sixteen. Um, and and yeah. Yeah, basically, you can use a DSLR now to shoot VR content with this I, fisheye lens. I'd really be interested to see like what the VR looks like because up until now, there are 360 degree VR cameras that shoot video like that, but it's usually like a thing you hold up and there's usually like a dead spot in the VR. If you look yeah. down, you'll probably see nothing. I wonder how warped this will be because fisheye mm. stuff is Very the whole warped, point yeah. of fisheye is to look really warped. But when you map it around like, a VR sphere, will it look more organic? Like, can they do mm -hmm. something with that? Uh, I'll be interested to see what happens here because I'm not, I think VR video needs a lot of work. There's some action cameras that kind of do it now, but it is, uh, it's hard to deal with. Would you, would you want to create some stuff, Sherlyn? Like, do you have VR projects in mind? 
No, no, I'm good. Y'all can see me in 2D and that's totally fine. Uh, too many, thing, too many. Yeah, dimensions yeah, yeah, already. Yeah, <laughs> we don't need to see exactly the relief of my face. We're good. Um, this this thing uh, shoots, it's so far only compatible with the uh, EOS R5, which is like mm -hmm. an 8K video uh, shooter as well. So it is, it is meant for like high res, high quality uh, content. But also, it's not just about the mount. Like, uh, Canon also has to release its um, VR system. Uh, there's UI. There's there's some stuff in the background it has to do to make all of this work, too. So it's, it's basically a very new thing um, that I don't think a lot of people are even doing yet. So I'd be interested to see what this does for, like, vloggers, influencers who are, mm. who, you know, have themselves invested in things like a, a Sony mirrorless or whatever to just mm. make their videos look great. <laughs> Uh, I want to see how YouTube might support this sort of content better in the future, just because YouTube supposed... supports VR video, so it does, it... but like yeah. not 8K streaming. So I don't know. We'll mm. see. Um, but yeah, there. I mean, we we got a vote, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna cut right now because we. I'm distracted yeah. by the vote going on the poll in the chat. It's okay. It's okay. Let me let um, me wrap this section. We can wrap that up. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's it for all of the other news right now. Let's move on to our Facebook chat with Chris Abel. All right. So we have, like, what, a good nine minutes to talk to the audience? We have a, we have a little yeah. bit of time, yeah. Hello, folks. Uh, Here we go. Well, yeah, I, we'll see. It, let's get maybe a better... Um, close? Yeah, close. On okay, how about, that? how about that? Okay, hold on. Like, you don't, okay. need, you don't need to queue up. Let uh, me, let me, let me just go. Yep, okay. I got it. Okay, I'm looking forward to when we can see you make a VR video, Sherlyn. <laughs> um, VR you know, mukbang. You can be the first VR live streamer. Maybe how about that? Okay, sure. Force me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's better. Okay. Okay, we can take a couple questions. Y'all, come on. Did you on. say VR mukbang? Yes, I did. Yep. Oh, man, that would be, yeah, that yep. would get crazy. That would be insane. Set up this dual fisheye camera in my face <laughs> while I slurp on some ramen. Oh my gosh. Okay, so Julio put a a poll in the chat saying, if you can eat an OS, which OS would taste better? And I am so surprised that more people aren't saying Mac OS because I think Mac OS would be more likely to taste like I, I think we lean heavy on PC users. So Zach, you upset Mac and Cheese OS, which I think mm. is delicious. I personally go for McDonald's OS or the Mac. McDonald's Mac could be Walker. a Mac, Mac, a Mac and cheese burger. McNuggets mm. OS. Mm. Yeah. Uh huh. A Mac and yeah. cheese burger. I like that. Apple is definitely the like a uh, higher end fast casual, you know, rather than just <laughs> cheap fast yeah. food. Yeah. More like a Shake Shack than a than a McDonald's. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. But uh, you, know, you have to wait in line for twenty minutes to get your Apple burger. Oh gosh. <laughs> Windows just doesn't. Oh, oh, a Microsofty OS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, no, they that, should. That's they better. should do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, we're going back to questions. Uh, yeah, we're going back to questions. So, if anyone wants to talk about uh, Windows, Windows 11, and um, it's maybe discontents. Uh, tell us what you think about Windows. What you think about the new should... Surface Slate? I... I have a quick question too. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Should we also do some of our um, picks and closing sections before Cursor gets here, or do you think we ha will have time after her? Nah, nah, we'll have time. Okay, we'll probably great. have time. Yeah, okay. it's fine. That's, take this, take this on... time to reset yeah. your conversation brain. Yeah, yes. we're gonna go deep on Facebook in a bit. Yeah, and you know we could toss picks if we need to. Like yep. it's always fun, but okay. there's just so much stuff going on there's right so now. So much stuff. So one thing that I wish that we had gotten into the very quick thing about Twitch is that mm -hmm. it, the reports did confirm that among the things that were leaked in this big Twitch hack was payment records oh, to right. <laughs> streamers. That's yeah, a don't, huge deal. Don't look, it, don't look at that, expose, anybody. It didn't expose bank information. Yeah. Let's be clear about that. But it did expose like, okay, you can see how much Pokemon is making on Twitch now. You can mm -hmm. see how much, uh, who is it? Dr. Disrespect or whatever. I do not follow streamers nearly as closely as yeah. I think the average Engadget user would. 
But yeah, if you are interested, you could definitely, um, probably within 10 or 15 minutes, you could get a very, very clear idea of how much your favorite streamer is making. Just don't. Just don't. Like, You'll just feel bad about yourself. Like, I would recommend every, every anybody. <laughs> just don't. You'll feel bad about your life choices and uh, what you're doing and everything. You can find out how much Ninja is making on Twitch. Oh, nope. no, no. Actually, Ninja is not yep. on Twitch. That's right. Nope. That's right. Uh, uh, however, T Pain is. I thought he Ninja moved. Left Twitch. He moved and he came back. He went. Ah, uh, he came back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ninja got paid out for the Microsoft thing. Of, yeah, exactly. Oh man, he um, get yourself uh, paid to be on a failed platform. That's uh that's the dream. Seriously, it truly I, is. Yeah. Uh, case in point, Quibi. <laughs> Um, since we have some time, I want to shout out to the people who are here that we didn't get to shout out earlier today. We had Michael answering a lot of questions. Gabriel had a lot of good questions. Zach Yop, uh, J. Mike Willingham, Jonathan Anderson, like I said before. Some new names like Hi Jaimito or Jaimito Frog. Hmm. Sir Holmes is not new, but hi. D-Man is here. Mark Dell is here. Wilso. Kenny Holland. So, I mean, lots of y'all came out for the Surface chats, I think. Um, so keep sending your Surface questions so that we can get to them. I saw Jiming Chung earlier this morning. Probably. <laughs> and hi to Danny. Danny, yeah. thanks for putting up with our technical difficulties today, too. Yeah. People are hearing weird sounds. I don't know. <laughs> Was that just mm. Julio? Is that their colloquialism for Julio chiming in? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi, Billy uh, Drake, Ron Barbaza. Uh, Ruin Dig. I remember Ruin Dig. Citizen Sky asks how much The Verge is making. I don't know. You could look it up, but we're not going to. Yeah. But uh, d don't look up the streamers. Don't look up like how much some TikTok people are making and stuff like that, because uh, this is a wild and crazy world. It's like looking at yeah. the NFTs and how much money people made with that or the GameStop stuff back in like a couple months ago. God. Uh, two delicious comments. CF542 yeah. says Mac OS is only one letter away from tacos. True. So very delicious. Wilso says all Android OSs are tasty. All this is also true up until Android 11. Uh, <laughs> Lollipop. I can't even remember anything before Nougat, Oreo. Yeah. yeah. What else, etc. And then uh, DJ underscore Italian said Mac OS will be vegan, which hey, I am all for. Mm -hmm. Until you want meat. Yeah. Nah, there's really good meat substitutes. I love them. There are. There are. Yeah. But it's Even never fish... the same. It's never the same. I, I mean, I'm I'm more of like a moderate to list or a omnivore. I just uh -huh. do all of it, but in moderate. Exactly. Exactly. That's all we do when we go on work trips is just we turn into the spirit of way monsters. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's our lesson at... from Spirit Away. Oh, yeah. man. Davindra, I was yep. looking at our old photos from Taiwan. That dinner we had at Putian in Taiwan was so hey, good. It's all good. That's uh, oh. We're all waiting for the world to reset so we can all just go binge food again, yeah. folks. Um, so Francis yeah. Thomas asks in the chat uh, if there is any timeline at all, or if it's even possible to do Android support coming Android... to Windows 11. Android app mm. support was supposed to be one of the one of the things coming to Windows, if I'm not wrong, right? There's uh, no date. There's no date for that. I didn't mention that here, but yeah, they said, eh, coming eventually, was, just like some of the, the game storage stuff, yeah? If I remember correctly, that was one of the things that was kind of promised with um, Windows 10X and then kind of like rolled in, or I, I, I forget if they even promised that with Windows 10X because we learned so little about 10X. There was nothing, yeah, shit yeah. about 10X, really. All we so the thing is in 10X, uh, I was looking at our photos from like the Surface Neo event and that whole thing it was like one of the last live Microsoft events we did. Um, that taskbar centered. You know, like that, the look of Windows 11 is pretty much what they were going for there. So pretty clear what was happening at some point. And then somebody just decided like, oh, look, let's just make everybody upgrade to this new thing. Um, see, shout out also to uh, our Engadget team members who are watching us uh, today. Yeah, Matt Smith may still be watching. Matt Smith lurking. He said in the chat, hello, friends, and also Devendra. <laughs> uh, Matt Smith was there, I think, at our last dinner. He was? Yep. Oh, yeah. No, exactly. That picture was great. We had seafood. It was 
Amaze balls. Amaze balls. Yeah. So we um, are getting ready to talk about Facebook. Yes. If anyone has any questions about Facebook stuff that we might be able to answer uh, right before we go live with this, yeah, we're waiting for our um, senior editor covering social media, Carissa Bell, to Join join us. the call. For sure. Mark Dell asks, why isn't Matt Smith working? And that's <laughs> yep. really the question we all have right now. Yeah. But it's the late actual, now. It's late in yeah, London. The, so, yeah. The yeah. actual answer is that um, it's late in London. And actually, Mark, you should know because you're British yourself. Apparently, we have all kinds of weird sounds going on. I really don't know. It's just weird. Julio having fun now. The Julio is our video producer who is trolling the chat room well yeah but they, like <laughs> julio also deserves to have some fun yeah absolutely he did a ton of work in the first like 15 minutes it's also maybe like 4 30 p.m in in london right now uh so listen we all stop working after three or is that just me <laughs> uh shout out to aaron who also is in the chat and also based in the london-ish area i don't want to be like london london i also don't want to out where he is um he can out that himself um but yeah 4 30 p.m is not so bad we All have right. a hello new carissa entrant in the ring in the new ring challenger new challenger carissa can we What's do up? the phone uh recording like we did last time with you two yep got here thank you very much you have DJ's headphones and everything to too sydney uh, i'm yeah. on airpods okay good Mm -hmm. Sydney is like what 2 a.m. right now? God. No, hang on, 14. Yeah. Why? Why? why Aaron, okay. shut up. You're close enough from London. Okay, you tra a train <laughs> ride from London. Stop it. It is the Londonish area. That's London everything is a train ride from London. Come on. It's a tiny country. It's, it's all close. Yeah. And thankfully, I was correct about the time in Sydney, Australia. All right. Aww. Carissa okay. is Sweet. ready. Hello, okay. Carissa. Okay. So, All right, folks, we're going to move on to Facebook chat. Ben, what's up? Yes, let's uh, just resync for mm -hmm. sanity's sake. Sure. So uh, when I count down from three, Devendra, Sherlin, and Carissa are mm -hmm. going to make a sound. Carissa, please make Clap, sure that you're... Whatever. Yes, please make sure that your phone is on airplane mode and the recording is running. Yep. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So syncing in three, two, one... Okay, let's go to Facebook. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so to round out the news this week, uh, we have to talk about everything that's happening with Facebook. And this all follows from the you know bombshell reports from the Wall Street Journal, where you know they're reporting on how Facebook is managing things like VIPs and the knowledge they had about you know uh, how Instagram is affecting teenage girls. Uh, now the whistleblower who leaked all that information. She talked uh, talked to 60 Minutes this weekend, Frances Haugen. And uh, she also, you know, uh, talked to Congress people as well. Uh, so she is out there just kind of basically laying it all out. And it's all pretty damning. So joining us to chat about uh, all of this is our senior editor, Carissa Bell, who covers social media. Hello, Carissa. Hey, Demetra. Hello, hello. Hey, Carissa. Hey, it's a busy week. It's a busy week for you, Carissa. Yeah. I feel like it <laughs> always is that for you. But uh, can you give us the basics? Like, who is Frances Haugen? And uh, what are some of her big revelations here? Yeah, so there's actually a lot. Like you, you mentioned, um, so Frances Haugen was a uh, product manager at Facebook. She was there for less than two years, as Facebook mm. PR keeps reminding all of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she, <laughs> she worked on the civic integrity team. And so that's the team that, you know, works on like countering, um, uh, you know, like election, uh, meddling, yeah, uh, misinformation and, and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Counter espionage, you know, they do some of like the mm -hmm. hardest work, you know, some of the biggest problems, um, that we all end up hearing about. Um, and so what she, uh, you know, she said on 60 minutes and, mm -hmm. and sense is that, uh, you know, she, after the election, uh, Facebook basically said that they're like disbanding that team, uh, which is something that we've seen uh, Facebook do uh, in other cases as well. And, you know, so she, you know, she began to get frustrated, thought about maybe leaving. And then she, you know, as she was, uh, you know, 
getting ready to to exit the company, she started like looking around on on Workplace, which is Facebook's internal system for kind of how they how they run things. People sort of it's sort of like the internal version of Facebook, just for employees. Mm. And she, you know, started finding all these documents from from researchers that were documenting things that were, you know, pretty disturbing to her. And so she kind of just started slowly collecting thousands and thousands of pages. And um, that's kind of now what's coming to light. There is so much going on here too. It is, mm-hmm. I think what's fascinating is that what she is saying is basically the stuff we, we've we been hearing for a while, but now we're seeing mm-hmm. documented evidence basically of, of Facebook ignoring its own research about the harm it's basically doing to society. And also she points out that, uh, hey, yeah, right after they um, disbanded the Civic Integrity Group and basically turned off a lot of features that were turned off features that were preventing misinformation from being spread. Um, the January 6th uh, uprising happened, you know, the insurrection on the Capitol. So, it, it, and we have evidence that people use Facebook to plan that that whole thing and everything. Um, Krista, like, what are you, you've been following this for so long. What makes this situation different than the other, you know, times we've heard about the bad stuff Facebook is doing? Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a few things, you know, we've definitely heard from from former employees before who have, you know, tried to uh, raise a lot of these same issues. Um, You know, some of them have also gotten a lot of attention. I think what's different here is that just how much she's providing, because Mm -hmm. it's not just her saying, as we've seen, you know, Facebook is already trying to like discredit her, Mm -hmm. you know, say she wasn't really that important at Facebook. She only worked there a brief period of time, but, you know, she sort of, uh, she brought receipts. (laughs) She has thousands of these documents, which are Facebook's own researchers who are, you know, pretty widely respected within the company and, Mm -hmm. you know, frankly, outside the company as well. Like, you know, they're, they're very smart people. They, they're very thoughtful people. They work really hard on, on all these issues and, you know, on issue after issue, you know, she's coming out with documents that are saying, you know, all these things that everybody outside the company is is worried about, all these things that are being raised, like the people inside the company whose job it is to kind of look at this, were also raising the alarm. Mm. Um, and for no reason it was ignored or they decided mm-hmm, to, mm-hmm. you know, not do anything about it. You know, so this is sort of like, I don't want to say smoking gun, but it's like a moment where we realize that, you know, Facebook knew vastly more than it than it's publicly let on. Absolutely. I- and I, yeah, but go ahead, Trillin. I just think that article that you uh, that you wrote, uh, Carissa, about what uh, how you said that Facebook should change. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that you pointed out in your your deck being the the chronological feeds should be brought back, right, and to be more transparent about mm-hmm. uh, some of these internal research that they're they're hearing about. Two things, right? One, imagine being the person that joins the company, uh, any organization that's big and has an internal network like work place and and just digging around and realizing you can find all of this information it doesn't matter how long you've been at the company you have access to those documents you like mm-hmm. that's that's it like it, i don't think facebook should be trying to discredit her but also but just that, I, that's what facebook does right exactly. like whenever whenever any of this criticism comes out it's like oh that person doesn't know what they're talking about you you don't have yeah. to be an expert an absolute expert in the field to see the results of facebook's own like methodology and research and also she's a very experienced person like she's worked at face uh, she's worked at google and other Mm -hmm. big companies like she she is an expert in her field and if she sees like there's a big enough problem here um i think we should definitely listen to her rather than ignore her uh one of the things that really caught me Um, that I think is really telling from the 60 Minutes interview is that she said that people who brought up this stuff within the company and tried to change things internally before were basically ground down by that process, right? Like by the resistance from the company and everything. So her conclusion is basically that Facebook can't, Facebook can't manage itself, you know, even though they have this whole, um, they have their board as well that they're that they're trying to you know that they're trying to set up as like a sign that they're getting some sort of oversight their oversight board um the results of that so far are pretty like weak i think too um i just want to say was it here the opening line from the senate testimony which also happened so 60 minutes was a sunday she also um uh haugen had senate testimony earlier this week too And I think the opening line from Senator Richard Blumenthal really just tells it all. 
And this is also pretty telling, too, because last week or yeah, exactly last week, he was also the guy saying, how do you stop Finstas, which I think made us think not as uh, not as highly of our elected officials in terms of like asking the big questions. But here he says, Facebook and big tech are facing their big tobacco moment. Facebook knows its products can be addictive and toxic to children to value their profit more. They value their profit more than the pain and the cause to children and their families. And I think that's like the big takeaway here. Like Facebook keeps pushing its uh, its systems and its algorithms um, because of uh, addictiveness, because of engagement, right? Rather than the effect it's having on society. Like Carissa, does any of this feel new to you or does it feel like we're basically like confirming stuff we've been hearing already? Yeah, I mean, that, that part's definitely not new. I, you know, I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, one thing that you mentioned is how, like just the, the incentives are so misaligned at Facebook. So, yeah. um, you know, a lot of her sources for like how she found these documents was badge posts, which is um, when somebody who works at Facebook leaves the company, you know, they write a post on, on workplace for everyone. Right. Um, they call that a badge post. And, you know, a lot of researchers left and kind of, you know, out of frustration, out of, you know, being, being burned out or, or what have you. And they would kind of post some of these things, like some of like the worst things that they, they had seen or that they thought weren't being addressed. So, you know, Mm -hmm. she definitely wasn't alone in in wanting to raise these issues. But one thing that she said, um, you know, during the hearing and and on 60 Minutes is that at Facebook, just the incentives are so misaligned. So you have, you can have researchers who are, you know, who are really thoughtful, talented people who come in and they really want to change the company. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for example, if you're, everyone's bonuses are based on uh, metrics around user engagement, then people aren't going to want to make those kind of hard changes that might negatively affect that, for example. Um, And there's many other examples throughout the company, Mm -hmm. you know, but it's just that the whole, you know, everything about the way Facebook was built is now just working against, you know, the people who are actually trying to, you know, do Mm -hmm. something good from the inside, I think. Absolutely. I think, hey, it's not just Facebook. I do also want to say this, like I've been covering startups since 2009, 2010, and uh, this was the mentality of everybody. It was Facebook, like engagement at all costs, move fast, break things. It was, this is how we survive. We we are just a, uh, we are a recovering tech economy, you know, like uh, big tech was barely a thing aside from Google and Apple and a couple others. Um, but yeah, all the social media companies, everybody was just chasing engagement. Um, I remember talking to the folks behind Instagram uh, when they were just a little startup, you know, before the big acquisition, before everything, like, all these people chasing the same sort of goal. Facebook is just the most successful at it. They've got over 2 billion users across the globe. And I think what we're seeing is a sort of like um, the limits of like, we don't know how to constrain something so big. Um, I think it's uh, it's telling that Haugen basically says that, uh, you know, she points to things the government has done to regulate big tobacco and seatbelts. Uh, seatbelts is a big one, by the way, because it's a, it reminds me of like where we are now with the uh, COVID vaccines. When seatbelts first started being introduced in cars, people complained. A lot of people complained about their freedom not to wear mm-hmm. seatbelts. Um, so it took a lot of regulation to kind of make that a thing. Uh, and it saved countless lives. Same thing with opioids and same thing, like these, these are all issues where the government took regulatory action because the industry can't control itself and the, certainly you can't rely on a single company to do that. Uh, do you, I feel like that's a point we've heard before, Carissa, but now seeing all this evidence, is this like, does this seem more and more legitimate? Like, do we, do you think from based on your all your reporting that regulation seems more necessary than ever? I think there's definitely more of an appetite than ever mm-hmm. um, is what kind of feels the, the biggest difference. I think a lot of people have been kind of asking for this for a long time. And, you know, throughout the past year, you know, even before she came forward, we saw, we've, I think we've seen just such a big interest um, from, from Congress, from the FTC, you know, from, from, different levels of the government and really kind of doing something to to rein companies like Facebook in. And to me, like, that's what feels um, feels different. I mean, we all remember, mm-hmm. you know, years ago, the, uh, the first time Mark Zuckerberg came before Congress and it was just kind of like a big joke and all these, um, yep. you know, senators asked him like really ridiculous questions. Like there was the Warren Hatch where he said rerun ads because he didn't understand how Facebook made money. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think what we've seen 
um, over the past year as they bring in uh, all these executives and, uh, and now the whistleblower is that they're really much more informed on these issues. They understand the nuances, um, the Finsta comment notwithstanding. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I think that they're really thinking really hard. And we've seen, you know, there's been some legis legislation that's proposed. There's been other things that, that Hagen's talking about with um, Section 230, with algorithms, with opening the research. So we're seeing a lot more like concrete ideas. So I think, you know, all that combined, it seems almost inevitable that we're going to see some movement on this. I think mm -hmm. it's more about kind of reaching the consensus and, and figuring out what the right path is because it is tricky. You know, there's a lot of ways that you get this very wrong. And yeah. Make things and worse. I think what's also super funny to see, or I don't know, sad to see, is that Zuckerberg didn't appear, you know, for the Senate testimony. He basically didn't issue comment for a while after the Senate testimony. Like he basically, he straight up just said he denies the fact that they profit prior, they prioritize profit over safety. And I just want to read a quote here because it seems like it just completely misses the ball in terms of like what people are saying and what the actual criticisms are. But Zuckerberg says, if we wanted to ignore research, why would we create an industry leading research program to understand these important issues in the first place? If we didn't care about fighting harmful content, then why would we employ so many more people to dedicate this uh, more than any other company in our space, even ones larger than us? Pause here. What's a bigger social media company than Facebook? <laughs> Uh, I mean, maybe, go ahead. I said maybe YouTube. I mean, I think that's, <laughs> that's the only thing I can think of that he's referring to. Or... Yeah, and it's completely a different thing too, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah, YouTube is just video. It's not about sharing like the stories and stuff like this. There, there are so many of these things. Um, he goes on to say, if we want to hide our results, why would we have established an industry leading standard for transparency and reporting on what we're doing? And if social media were as responsible for polarizing society as some people claim, then why are we seeing polarization increase in the US while it stays flat or declines in many countries with just as heavy use of social media around the world? And it is weird. I call this a defensive baby quote because this is one of those things you hear from companies and people where they're like, they're not addressing the actual complaints you're making. Um, a lot of these things he's saying, um, it's great that you're employing big, you know, great uh, deep research. That doesn't mean you're actually listening to them. And if your company has a history of like burying things and hiding findings that, you know, from the government and from other people uh, that could potentially hurt your profits, that's, uh, that's something worth considering. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll have to look at uh, his claims about polarization uh, in other countries too. And th there is a lot of things we got to talk about, right? Because polarization is not inherently bad. We should have disagreeing voices. Like unless you live in a dictatorship where everybody thinks the same way, that's not necessarily bad, but extreme polarization, like we're seeing here in the US where it involves everything like vaccines and... Um, basic facts in reality, I think that's kind of where the bigger issue is. Uh, Carissa, my question for you is, where do you think Facebook goes from here? Well, um, you know, I think they're, they're definitely in trouble right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we've seen this, I think Zuckerberg's comments, you know, that you just, you just read, you know, on one hand you can read it. And if you don't know anything about the company you can say like, yeah. well, this all kind of sounds like reasonable yeah. things. Zuckerberg's very good. You mentioned, you know, he's very good at deflecting, not, not really addressing the real underlying issue um but i think between that and you can see how just how combative um other facebook executives their their comms team has been in this i think they're mm -hmm. they're really they're really worried about this because now it's it's not just one employee they can say is you know disgruntled or um you know just kind of like try to discredit what people are saying but if somebody's coming with actual, you know, mm -hmm. thousands of pages of documents from their own researchers who are respected, who were hired by Facebook to do this work. And, you know, all of a sudden you have uh, an argument that's, you know, much harder to, you know, just bat down or, or what have you. So I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of what actually will, will happen to them, I mean, it's very hard to, to predict. I mean, like there's always been, I think for years now, there's been people calling for, you know, Zuckerberg to to step down. That seems very unlikely. He has immense control over that company. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But I think, you know, we've already seen just some small changes from Facebook. They paused Instagram kids. 
They're now um, slowing down other new product development to conduct reputational reviews. Um, <laughs> that was in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. So I think we're already kind of seeing them like go into you know panic mode. And I think once more of this kind of starts to come out, once she starts talking to um, regulators and lawmakers in Europe, um, more you know the SEC starts their investigation based on all these disclosures. I you know I think we can see just how bad this can really get for them. Absolutely. And uh, it's important to point out, like, uh, Francis Hagen or Hagen is not saying Facebook should be broken up or destroyed. And actually, no. she says the opposite. She's calling for stronger regulation. But uh, she, she says that, you know, if we if we break up Facebook, it's actually going to be harder to fix a lot of these problems. It's like one of those horror movie things where you kill a monster, you know, you destroy a monster. And it turns into like five different monsters that attack you all at once. Uh, uh, separate companies may not have the resources to fix the things that need to be fixed. Um, she points out that Facebook is relied upon by small businesses around the world. When Facebook went down uh, earlier this week, that was on Monday, they're saying that was just a server error, but that directly affected business, you know, and the way families can talk to each other. Like there is good this company does. So I, I think I, I was watching like a lot of people on Twitter, especially big tech people and VCs being like, oh my God, look at all this whining about Facebook. And that's not the point, people. The point is like, this can be good. This whole thing is good. Um, social media is not inherently bad, but when these companies like ignore the harm they're doing to society, I feel like we got to call them out on that. So I'm hoping we'll see more stronger regulate, more stronger regulation, and maybe more discussions of things like this. Uh, Carissa, like, what is? Are, are we expecting more from Facebook? Like, do we expect them to respond more to this, or are we just gonna get more information coming over the next couple of months? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely going to be a kind of probably drip drip of more of this stuff mm -hmm. coming out. And, you know, as we learn more about what's actually in this, because we're so far, very few of these documents have actually been made public. Yeah. Um, I think Facebook is, you know, they're very much on the, on the defensive right now. They're also, um, you know, they're really just trying to like come up with their own version of the narrative. I don't know how successful that will be. They're being, like I said, their, their cost people are being very combative on Twitter. They were like during the hearing responding to individual reporters, um, <laughs> you know, who were tweeting what she was saying. And so, um, so yeah, their, their strategy has been a little bit muddled there, but I think we're definitely going to, to keep hearing more. Um, and then if I could just point out one other thing that I think sure. is important about this is that, you know, one of the points that she made is that Facebook should be required to open their research um, to researchers outside the company. And I think mm -hmm. that's just a really important point because one thing that we've seen from the documents that we've already, you know, gotten to look at is that the people who are, who are doing this research, like they do have some like thoughtful ideas on like how to fix these problems. They've run, um, you know, in some cases tests, uh, on different ideas that actually show some promise. So there are people within the company who have ideas about fixing this. Um, if they make it available to, you know, researchers mm -hmm. outside the company who have been really wanting to get access um, to these kinds of documents, this kind of information. Like, I think there are real solutions. I think sometimes we think about Facebook and we just think it's like this big unsolvable problem and it's ruined society. And there's like nothing we can do. But I think one thing that like could come out of this that would be really positive is like if the people who are actually you know these issues the best are able to, you know, talk about their ideas for fixing this more openly and come up with solutions. I think that could also make a really big impact here. I, I, was, be, I was yeah. going to say that that I mean, that was the second thing I was trying to get to the other yeah. thing earlier on, which is that the two things that you say the Facebook would do one of which is to open up the research, like you just said, the other thing was to go back to chronological feeds, which I think just is the whole reason we're in this place where, where people's mental health is being affected by these apps is because the algorithm keeps trying to feed you things and things you want to see based on one or two things you've checked out. Mm -hmm. And that just keeps reiterating and, you know, reemphasizing certain concepts and ideas. Like I, I checked out one bachelor in paradise post. Now I just see bachelor in paradise <laughs> all the time. Like yep. I don't uh -huh. need to keep seeing these, you know, like TV relationships all the time. I do think going back to chrono when when they started to move away from chronological feeds too, I think there was a lot of criticism about what that would do. And now we're yeah. seeing the effects of it. And just those are the two things that again, like I said, Carissa, you called out in your article as as things that uh Hogan said that Facebook should do. And I fully agree. Mm -hmm. I just don't know that like Facebook would do it. I think more open collaboration with other organizations, with our researchers, being yeah. being just more transparent in general would be good, but 
No, I mean, they, not a lot of faith there in them. <laughs> they just recently cut off NYU researchers who were doing work uh, into like how how Facebook is actually affecting society. So, yeah, again, we we can't trust them that much. Uh, Want to point out that. Twitter looks like a really interesting alternate universe right now where it's like it has an algorithmic feed, but you can turn on the chronological feed, yes. which is I always go back and do the that. Because option, yes. I, I like having the option, although by default, and sometimes it resets back to their weird sure. algorithmic feed, yep. and I hate that. Uh, but Facebook or Twitter is like doing a bunch of things and testing things in terms of like the health of its network too. So I just wrote up a story the other day too about their heads up thing where they'll give you a heads up about um, if you're gonna jump into this conversation, hey, Trigger they're arguing yeah. about Sora being in Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Uh, step, maybe, maybe be careful before <laughs> you start arguing with these nerds. Um, things like that, like the really contentious arguments, like it'll give you the heads up like, hey, just watch out. And uh, a reminder that there was another person at the end of the keyboard, you know, try to keep things civil, things like that. I wonder if we need, it's a bit of like nannying, but also apparently like I think research has shown just making people aware of that, like those things, contentious conversations, and also the fact that there is another human over there tends to do a lot to reduce things too. So I'm really interested in seeing how Facebook and uh, Twitter tackle some of these problems that Facebook is also dealing with too. Uh, but yeah, we will keep an eye on all of this. Thank you so much for joining us, Carissa. Where can people find you on the internet these days? Um, always on Twitter. <laughs> always on Twitter. <laughs> yes, always on Twitter. Uh, Carissa B.E. on Twitter. Chris B and check out all of Chris's coverage over in Gadget. Uh, you, I feel like you're always working really hard because there, the social media stuff just never stops. So good luck to you. I know how it is. Uh, it can be really crushing sometimes, but we're looking forward to more of your Facebook coverage down the line. Thanks, Carissa. Thank you. All right. You can pause your recording okay. yeah, and, and then, shoot that to Ben. Yeah, and then send that to me when you're ready. And then, okay. I don't know, if we can do picks really quickly, maybe we I can, can do them. I can just, I can do it real quick. Like, we got 10 minutes, yeah. or we got a little time. Yeah, sure. that's fine. And, Chris, say you, you can feel free to hop on out. Thank you so much for giving us your okay. time this morning. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. All right, chat room. You guys are lucky because we were going to skip picks, but... I want a little fun thing to like <laughs> cap off the annoyance of Facebook right now. So palette I will cleanser. palette cleanser. Exactly. <clears throat> I'll throw us to that. Are you ready to go, Sherlyn? Yo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready too. All right, folks, let's uh, work out all of our anger against Facebook and everything mm -hmm. here. Let's talk about fun stuff. Uh, we've got some pop culture picks this week. Sherlyn, what do you got for me? I, so uh, again, I haven't, so this week, end i guess i uh -huh. watched this this is not a pick this is just me telling you that whatever i saw this weekend was not worth mentioning but i will tell you what i saw which is an the movie. yeah the movie called san andreas <laughs> Ages ago. Okay. i mean the the rock movie the rock yeah san great. andrea san andreas san andreas, i'm sorry yeah. yeah uh san andreas and then i also saw the bruce willis uh movie that was basically westworld i don't even remember the title at this point uh but anyhow yeah two, wow. two, two not great movies but like whatever my brain was numb i needed um the 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 self i like your movie podcast stuff right here it's like i don't know the name of this movie but you know yeah. one of those garbage bruce willis ones which, I, yeah whoo, yeah he, he makes movies he goes on set for like a day basically to like shoot a thing and uh that's his picture oh, yeah. for that week. i read the yeah. i read the review afterwards you're like uh bruce willis seemed like he was just done with this whole thing i was like yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm, cool that's every movie yeah yeah anyway uh so because i've been watching garbage I was like, I'll, I'll go back to one of my older picks. And this uh -huh. week, my pick for you guys is Settlers of Catan, the app, the website, the basically app. Catan Universe. Catan um, Universe. It's, it's available on Android, iOS, desktop, uh, through your browser. And I, I really, so my friends introduced me to Catan recently. I was pretty terrible. And then, like, I installed it on Android. And I've been getting better ever since. Oh, I my with, God. 
Is this AI? your new obsession? Is this oh your gosh. new? No, no, no. I sit and play this for eight hours. I've been on like all the Candy Crush style games. There's this game called Royal Match that I've yep. been playing. No. Nope. Uh, not great because all I wanted to do was uh, kill the king, but the king can't die. Yeah. Anyway, talk about like addictive, and this is something we're gonna have to talk about eventually too. Oh, yeah. But like the same addictive mechanisms that Facebook is relying on to keep you engaged is the same stuff yeah. all these games are doing. So like social gaming, if you remember when Zynga was such a thing, oh. that was really the thing behind Farmville and everything like man yeah. these companies have hacked our brains to just like take our attention that's basically it so totally. you're liking Catan so, that's great Catan yeah Catan on on, on Catan.com slash whatever go to the digital games they have like so many versions of their app you can play it with people you can play for free uh you'll have to you know only play once a day if you play for free but if you just pay the like 4.99 unlock fee you can play like non-stop which is what i do it's very good distraction when i'm on the treadmill slash the elliptical which is slightly less dangerous mm-hmm. um so yeah <laughs> that, that's a it's a very good way to keep my mind off the fact that i wait are have... you playing Catan while you're on the elliptical in your yeah. exercise room in your apartment building in our in our gym in yeah. your gym yeah yeah yeah, it's a, it's a good way to forget that I, it's a good way to take my mind off the 20 minutes of pain. It's like, it's weird, yeah. oh, this you should, bitch you should ask my other way, people. Ron. Anybody else here? You got your phone? Let's, let's play a game of Catan while we, yeah. while we sweat. Yeah, yeah exactly. Maybe, maybe you're creating something new. <laughs> yes. Anyhow, anything else, Sherlyn? Uh, that's it. That's my big stress buster right now. It's Catan. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the yeah, the mission for next week is to figure out which bad Bruce Willis movie Sherlyn is talking about. Yeah. That is your goal chat room uh email us at podcast and gadget or just tell us in the chat next week uh i have been watching squid game like the rest of the world and uh yeah everybody was telling me to watch it it is it is very very good and i think what is fascinating about squid game which is it's a korean series about uh people who are basically in debt dealing with economic issues um they get rounded up to participate in these games which are horrific and deadly and yep. bad. Um, this show is like a mixture of Battle Royale with a bit of like Old Boy in there too. And yeah. Battle Royale, the movie I'm talking about, but Old Boy, which is depending on the day, is probably my favorite film. Like, just I, I love Park Chan Wook. So uh, I think like this show is a comedy of just everything I love from Korean cinema mm-hmm. and also like stories that are actually trying to say something like trying to say something about the state of the world and the horrors of capitalism the fact that oh my god we are we are living in a society where everyone is just struggling to get by and this game that is deadly but could potentially solve all their debt problems seems so like real for a lot of people too so it's incredibly well written it's uh, directed and created by Huang Dong Hyuk and i think uh i think this guy is like he's going to be doing incredible things um love all the characters i love that there's actually also uh, i believe an indian character mm-hmm. um there is a brown guy in the show which you never see in actual like in most korean series and also dives into like how indian workers are treated when they go to other asian countries basically it's like oh, yeah. low low wage labor and treated like garbage so there's a lot of that in there too i kind of appreciate that but it's, it's a great show if you liked parasite if you like battle royale and certainly if you like old boy, there there's a lot to love in here. I can't wait till you start seeing Mr. Lin. It is it's really good. I can I see can why it's wait. been memed. Yeah. I, I can't wait to start watching it too. Um <laughs> quick shout, the Bruce Willis movie that I was talking about is not that that the movie is very similar to Westworld in concept. The title is Vice. So Vice. I mean, I was leaving that for our listeners to fix, Sherlyn, so uh, <laughs> no, some people got it wrong in the chat thinking it was that was the game. That that was the game. Um, like something else. <laughs> was uh, anyway, Squid Game. It's really good. I also finished, uh, you know, uh, Midnight Mass. I don't know if you finished it yet. But I did. It's so good. I finished it last week. Yeah. So so good. Like Mike Flanagan. Mike Flanagan, genius man. Uh, no, watch everything too, he does. Mm-hmm. One too many monologues, but okay. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> give it. Give it to me. Give him all of it because uh, it's worth mentioning. Like. Uh, I think a thing Stephen King does really well in his books is build characters up. It's really hard to get like internal sensibilities in a right. TV show or a movie. And the way Mike Flanagan does that is with monologues, which fine. Sure. Uh, I did not expect a horror series to really like also gel with my, the way I define my place in the universe too. Like mm-hmm. it's a really big philosophical thing, even though it's also about scary stuff and uh, religion. So check out Midnight Mass, check out Squid Game, everybody. 
And thank you for joining us on the Engadget Podcast. Trillin, you can wrap it. All right, everyone. That's all right, everyone. That's it for the episode this week. Thank you as always for listening. Our theme music is by game composer Dale North. Our outro music is by our very own Terrence O'Brien. The podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find Devendra online at at Devendra on Twitter, and I do the Filmcast podcast at thefilmcast.com. If you have wonderful PG-13 ideas for what to shoot in VR, you can hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Sherlyn Lowe. Email us your thoughts at podcastandengadget.com. Leave us a review, please, on iTunes. And subscribe on anything that gets podcasts, including Spotify. Okay. All right. All right what a beast of an episode. It's going to be a big one. I think we're going to let Ben get started early. Thank you so much, yes, folks, stop. for joining us. Um, stop recording. Stop recording. So you could, thank you for dealing with all the tech issues with us, folks. And shout out to Julio, who had to juggle yeah. to fix a lot of these issues we're dealing with. So Ooh. thank you, Julio. Your work is always appreciated. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yes, and this stream comes to you via our video team, which is led by Kyle Mock with Owen David. O Oop, excuse me. Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. No, we. Well. Yeah, some some people have left, Ooh. but uh, this stream comes to you via our video team, which is led by Kyle Mock with Julio Barrientos and Luke Brooks. There we go. It's there we go. Powered by everyone in in the chat. You know, big thanks to people like Mark Dell, Wilso, um, Ed Edgar Ferrasso, J. Mike Willingham. Um, Tanmay uh, Shirsha, uh, so many people. Sorry if I can't shout you out, but really, thanks for thanks to everyone for bearing with us, especially during these technical difficulties at the very beginning of the episode. Um, you're the one who makes it fun. If you stuck around this long, rate the show on iTunes. Come on, you, we were just talking about how algorithms rule our lives. So, Sadly. Help us yeah. out with that algorithm specifically, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, folks. Thank you.